uh, this talk may be a little bit different. Probably going to be a little bit more chaotic. Uh, it was too many cups of coffee. My day job is working at a place called the USC Institute for Creative Technologies. We are largely DOD funded. We do uh, research, applied technology, and then my group works on advanced prototypes that are directed at training. And we're trying to train soft skills like cultural sensitivity, leadership, decision making. I've also been a technology evangelist of some sort for the past couple of decades. And I've bought a lot of really shiny objects because they're new and cool. And then they sit in a drawer somewhere and then get sold on eBay. But today I want to talk, I want to take a little bit different angle on things. I want to offer a little bit of a cautionary tale about what I view as some issues with digital technology and where we need to pay a little bit closer attention to what's going on. So uh, anybody in animation knows this plot well. This is uh, called the Uncanny Valley. It's a phenomenon where if you have an animated character, as it gets more and more lif lifelike, you have engagement, but at some point it gets creepy. And it turns out that creepy is a bad thing. Now, uh, my colleague Paul Devevic in his, grab, uh, his lab at ICT has been doing some work on high-tech scanning. If you've seen Avatar Benjamin Button, you've seen his work. And they've, uh, they've been pushing the boundary, and I'm going to argue that we're pretty close to being across this valley. So this is digital IRA. It's actually Ari Shapiro, who is a researcher in our lab. We scanned him in our light stage, and then working with Activision, created this virtual real-time rendering of the character. So this is running live in a game engine. If you look at the detail, I would argue that we're pretty darn close. It speaks for itself. So this is great, right? I can create digital versions of myself. I can send them out in the digital world. They can be doing all the mundane tasks. And then I've got all this new free time. What could possibly go wrong? Well. That's the same thing I think some researchers were saying around the 1940s. I would argue that virtual humans and virtual reality is, in fact, the Manhattan Project of the 21st century. With any fundamental change, there is great opportunity, but there's also great danger. So we need to pay very close attention to some of the underlying principles. I don't want to judge. I'm not going to judge digital. I just want to get at the underlying issues. So, I would argue that the main difference, or the real fundamental sea change, took place around 1995 when Netscape went public. Anybody born after that is what I refer to as a digital native. My son, who's 16, born in 1996, is a digital native. These are people who have never known a world without the internet, without cell phones, without touch interface, without game consoles. So you would think for them, that all of this digital stuff is great. And there are a lot of studies that show that they think differently, although it, the data is not all in. The problem is that we're humans, and we're fundamentally analog. So I really want to explore this difference between digital and analog. Now, what do I mean between that, uh, by that? I'm speaking right now. Sound waves are, are filling the room. That's analog. They're analog sound waves. And without getting into uh, too deep into Schrodinger wave equation. Let's just leave it at an analog sound wave can be reproduced in, by analog means. It's being reproduced by digital means most of the time now, and it turns it into zeros and ones. And what that means is it takes a continuous motion and turns it into stair steps. It's on and off. It's zeros and ones. And this is a fundamental difference between analog and digital. Another way to think about this is that digital is essentially black and white, on, off, it's a, that's, and that's how the data gets manipulated. Humans, on the other hand, are incredibly nuanced. The thing that humans do very well is pick up on subtle variations that are happening around them and reading a room. Digital has a very difficult time doing that. So the humans and analog is more shades of gray. Now, channeling my days as a chemistry professor, uh, I consider analog and digital to be what's called orthogonal, meaning they go in different directions. From a chemistry standpoint, the implication is that orbitals that are orthogonal, when they overlap, they cannot form a bond. Now think about that. If two things are orthogonal and they come together and they overlap, but they can't form a bond, they have to either reorient or rehybridize. So is that a metaphor for what's happening now with analog beans in a room mediated by digital technologies. Consider that everything that you do right now is, is, uh, is digitally mediated. 
your telephone, your television, Instagram, Facebook, email, all of your e-commerce is digitally mediated. So it's easier than ever to make connections. We've, you people registered online. That was all digitally mediated. You didn't have to go to a box office. You didn't have to sleep overnight to get the concert tickets in the front row. But it may be harder than ever to make those connections meaningful in a digital world. So audiophiles argued about lossy versus lossless, CD versus vinyl for a lot of years, and what was getting lost in translation. What we need to do now is, as virtual versions of ourselves are out in, in the wild, what are the implications and what things are in fact getting lost in translation? So I want to give you three examples. The first example is from the world of digital dating, and I have to thank my wife, Shirley Tsai, for letting me put her Match.com profile from seven years ago up here. <laughs> now, this is a virtual human. It is a representation, I can see it, and I can interact with it. I can wink at it, I can send it an email. But at some point, I will need to meet that physical human being. So the fact that we got married is a testament that digital is a wonderful tool for people making connections. However, it was only after over a year of me online dating, figuring out that there's a whole new set of memes and rules that now I have to adopt in order to make this thing work because the digital profile that you may fall in love with may or may not accurately reflect the analog person who created it. A second example, all of your e-commerce is now mediated by digital and there's automated training. One of the most interesting examples from a couple of months ago was when the AP Twitter feeds was hacked and they put this message that the White House was bombed. There are automated trading algorithms that scrape Twitter feeds, and it turns out that bombs in White House is a bad thing according to their algorithms, and it sent the market plunging. So this is another example of digital sort of running amok. Now, digital is great. 99.9% .9 of the time, it works perfectly. Where it falls apart is at the boundary conditions and the edge conditions. And this is actually where humans are pretty good at doing a tap dance. Something goes wrong, they can usually figure it out. When an algorithm goes wrong, you're pretty much dead in the water. The third example comes from music. To, uh, to steal a phrase from Earl Morris, auto-tune has become fast, cheap, and out of control. So basically, for those that don't know, auto-tune is the ability to take a voice input or another signal input and correct it to the right pitch. There's a whole epistemological and, and uh, religious argument about what right means in that case, but I'll leave that for another day. But I want to show you an example of this. In this case, digital is reactive, and human beings are proactive and creative, and there's where part of the problem is. So I want to bring my friend and vocalist Claire Riffle up to demonstrate some of this. So we have Hopefully, we should be good to go. Do you have a voice? So this is a TC Electronic harmonizer pedal. It's amazing. That small pedal will do multi-part harmony, do auto-tune. It senses what notes I'm playing on my bass and then adjusts her voice accordingly. It's pretty cool and something that um, is pretty mind-dropping. So here's, here's an example. Strumming my pain with his fingers, singing my life with his words, killing me softly with his song, killing me softly with his song, telling my whole life with his words, killing me softly. Pretty cool, right? But now, what happens when we let digital get out of the way of analog and just let the analog human being express themselves? And instead of worrying about reaction from the digital, go wherever they want. his fingers, singing my life with his words, killing me softly with his song, killing me softly with his song, telling my heart 
whole life with his words killing me softly with his soul so I don't know about you I, uh, the first one is cool but to me it's kind of a gimmick when the soul is allowed to come forth so at some point, you can have all of these digital communications, but at some point, invariably, it will come down to a human-to-human -human interaction. Yet, we are surrounded and inundated by digital media and digital communication tools. So my question is, where is the balance and where do we go from here? I'm not advocating that everyone become a Luddite. I'm far from a Luddite, and you don't need to go to the bunker in South Dakota yet. Um, the it, Skynet is active, though, and I've probably said too much. <laughs> the, the issue, though, is how do you find the balance between the analog and the digital, and what are the new ways to think about this? So I think key is embrace the digital. The analog and digital worlds are both growing, and it, the genie is not going back in the, in the bottle. So how do we make this work? How do we correlate these things? So I have a challenge for all of you because there are a lot of people out here who create things or in a variety of fields. If you're in e-commerce, if you're in edutainment, if you're in learning, if you're in game design, the challenge is how can you create that balance so that people can use your digital tools to connect in a meaningful manner? So to take a clue from my base here, can analog digital achieve a yin-yang relationship where you're not covered by digital, but the two complement each other, and in fact, you need one for the other to work? So that's, that's my parting shot, is to think about how yin-yang and analog and digital, how we can get that coexistence to work. Now, uh, I've been lucky enough to study with Victor Wooten, who played with Bella Fleck and the Flectones, He's a phenomenal guy. He's a more amazing human being. He talks a lot about how music is a language. So to close this talk, I want to invite Claire back up, and I want to have a musical conversation. And because this is a profoundly real-time, continuous, analog interaction, you're all part of this. So we're all part of the conversation, and we need to keep the conversation going. And just to show that I'm going to try and find my own yin-yang, I've got this bass, which was hand-built by Vinnie Federa in Brooklyn, New York, but it has digital electronics inside. The cabinet down here has a digital power amp in it. However, you will notice the glowing bottles of joy on top. These are analog tubes. That is my preamp. And in fact, the chord charts are on an iPad, because my memory isn't good enough to remember all of the chord changes in the song we're going to play. But the sound and the energy is in my hands, in Claire's voice, and within this room. My romance doesn't have to have a moon in the sky. My romance doesn't need a blue Passing by no month of May, no twinkling stars, no holiday, and no soft guitars. My romance doesn't. A castle rising in Spain, nor a dance to a constantly surprising refrain. 